Hi everyone, olá a todos, boa noite. Welcome to everyone, it's great to have you all here with us this evening. And good morning to Professor Pennycook in Sydney, Australia. My name is Cristine Severo, I'm a professor at Federal University of Santa Catarina and at the postgraduate program of linguistics. I have been working with language policy, colonial linguistics and critical sociolinguistics and I will be your host today. Before we begin, I would like to thank Abraling and its president, Miguel Oliveira, together with his supporting committee for promoting such an inspiring online academic project that brings together linguists from all parts of the world. We have been sharing a unique feeling of academic community with all the challenges it might bring. The Abralin Ao Vivo, the Linguistics Online, is the initiative of Abralin, Associação Brasileira de Linguística, Brazilian Association of Linguistics, in cooperation with several international partners, among them the Comité Internacional Permanent de Linguistas, La Asociación de Linguística y Filología de América Latina, eh, La Sociedad Argentina de Estudios Linguísticos, La Sociedad Española de Linguística, the Linguistic Society of America, the Linguistic Association of Great Britain, the Australian Linguistic Society, and the British Association for Applied Linguistics. In such individualistic political times, it's really important that we strengthen our associations and help to co-construct these institutions. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce you to our keynote speaker today, Professor Alistair Pennycook, who is Distinguished Professor of Language, Society, and Education at the University of Technology, Sydney, and Research Professor at the Center for Multilingualism in Society across the lifespan at the University of Oslo. He is known for his work in three main areas. The first one, critical approach to the global spread of English and English language teaching. His main public Publications related to this area include the cultural politics of English as an international language and the global Englishes and transcultural flows. Both books were winners of the British Association of Applied Linguistics Book Prize. His second area is critical applied linguistics with the publication of Critical Applied Linguistics, a critical introduction and Post-Humanist Applied Linguistics, which won the BAAL Book Prize in 2018. And the third area is sociolinguistic studies of multilingualism, diversity, popular culture, and mobility. The main publications are Language and Mobility, Unexpected Places, Popular Culture, Voice and Linguistic Diversity, with Sandra Dovichin and Shaila Sultana, Disinventing and Reconstituting Language with Professor Sinfri Marconi, uh, Metrolingualism, Language in the City with Emi Ochuji, and Language as a Local Practicing. His most recent book written together with Sinfri Marconi is Innovations and Challenges in Applied Linguistics from the Global South. The title of his talk today is from speaking to semiosis in search of sociolinguistic comprehensiveness. Professor Pennycook, many, many thanks for your presentation. And please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Christina. Uh, and uh, thank you to Abralin for this invitation. Uh, and um, bon noche to everyone on that side of the world. Uh, Good morning to anyone over this side of the world. It's uh, Thursday morning here in Australia. Um, but yeah, thank you to everyone for making this possible. Uh, as, as Christine was saying, I think it's important we uh, manage to do these things in these difficult times. Uh, I don't like particularly talking in this mode. Uh, I've been, like a lot of us, I think, teaching uh, online. Um, and it's it works, but it's also very difficult. And I, I find it very hard. Um, not being able to see an audience, not knowing who I'm talking to, uh, not being able to see whether people are nodding or shaking their heads or whatever. I just have to talk into this, um, feels like a rather empty space. And I, um, it would be nice to be back talking to people and knowing who's there. So, um, so I ask for some um, people to be generous with uh, this mode of talking, which I think is, is also quite difficult for all of us. Um, 
I'm going to share my screen now and uh, move into the talk. So just give me a moment, please. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a talk, uh, I thought I'd aim it at a, what I hope is a fairly broad uh, social linguistic, uh, critical social linguistic audience. Um, and it's framing some ideas I've had working through some of the data uh, from work I've been doing, particularly with uh, my colleague Emi Otsuji. Um, so I'll, I'll talk through why I'm, uh, the ideas of speaking and semiosis in a moment. So briefly, I'm going to look at uh, the idea of the total speech situation, which um, is a slightly problematic notion, I think, but it's, it's useful to think about. Um, and I want to talk about this expansion of social linguistic scope. Um, and I'll move into this, uh, maybe we call it a framework of, of semiosis rather than speaking. And then I want to look at uh, particularly various sets of data, one particular piece, but various others from uh, a Bangladeshi run store in Tokyo that Emmy and I have been working with and then move to one or two conclusions at the end of that. So let's move to the idea of the total speech situation, which as I said is, it's not a, it's always an impossibility, right? But I was interested actually going back to uh, Austin in his book, How to Do Things with Words, uh, where he raises this question, says in order to understand um, an utterance uh, in any complete way uh, and understand the, the effects of a speech act, we need to understand the total speech situation uh, without necessarily, Austin didn't necessarily specify what that would be. And of course, it's a huge challenge and, and ultimately impossible one. Um, I think if we look at the line of work that followed around speech act theory and so on, the, um, it didn't really take up that challenge at all and, and went, uh, particularly in a, a direction of trying to understand speech acts and so on from a rather linguistic uh, and also intentional uh, point of view to try and say can we define how that works and so on. Um, Judith Butler takes this up uh, in an interesting way uh, and of course makes the obvious point that we can't really decide how best to delimit the totality of the speech situation and, and I should say again I'm not going to try and claim I'm doing the total speech situation, just saying it's an interesting challenge for us, uh, one we know we can never get to. Uh, Butler's point is that uh, when we're looking particularly at things like performatives that Austin was interested in, and Butler particularly so, uh, the moment we look at things like routine forms of, of language use, uh, we have to look outside the particular temporality of the speech situation because language uh, has its effects because of its repeated action. Um, and that also links to, to Derrida and, and others' work of the idea of iteration. Um, so Butt was saying, you know, we can't capture uh, the total speech situation by looking at the here and now. We have to look very much at least at the past, possibly also at the future. Another locus for this broad idea is, is also in, in uh, Silverstein's work. And of course, that's coming through the uh, tradition of linguistic anthropology. Um, and, and of course, from a linguistic anthropological view, we're already going to be looking generally at a, a wider understanding of what the speech situ situation is going to be than if we're looking from uh, some of the more narrow uh, ways we've framed this in linguistics and social linguistics, at least in the past. Um, Silverstein people may recall talks about the total linguistic fact. And he's trying to get here at the relation between uh, linguistic form uh, and the use of the language. And then what he calls the cultural ideology, which got took up, taken up a lot in terms of uh, linguistic ideology or language ideologies. And so he's looking at, at this, um, as he says, an unstable relation between these three parts of the total linguistic fact. And of course, Silverstein isn't claiming again to uh, to have the totality here. He's just saying we these are all things we need to build in. Um, interestingly, Blomet, uh, who worked with Silverstein and is taking up again very much in that tradition, uh, talks more recently about what he calls the multimodal total semiotic fact, and he's trying to do uh, similar things to what I've been doing, um, and is I think as I'm going to argue a current move across 
what we might call the new social linguistics, uh, to look at the, uh, as he says here, multimodal. So we're trying to look at more things than just linguistics narrowly defined, and, and also a, a semiotic fact. So we need to move away from a narrow view of what counts as signs and so on. Um, so for Blomet, we have to look at this multiplicity of factors and the complexity of the stuff going on uh, around language and society. So we, we see these moves to, to um, no one is really claiming to want to get or that they can get to the total speech situation, but the idea is in a sense, we need to build in more and more. And this is part of what I want to talk about um, and also raise the questions what the pitfalls of this might be. Um, one way this has been taken up is with an idea of semiotic landscapes. And I was interested uh, that um, Penny Eckert uh, in her book on the third wave of social linguistics, her final chapter talks about semiotic landscape. Uh, and I, I perhaps tongue in cheek wonder whether that is the fourth wave of social linguistics. Um, is this, uh, as we move into this broadening of what counts as, as language in some ways. Um, for Eckert, that semiotic landscape is what is about what she calls the production of locality. Uh, and in an interesting way that echoes what, what Butler was saying about the, the fact that we can't capture the speech situation because of the temporality of, of repeated language. Uh, Eckert is talking here about um, the, the, we've got these diff different resources um, that are combined, so both local and more global or more distant uh, resources that um, produce a here and a there uh, around any uh, speech situation. Um, more literally, the idea of semiotic landscape, of course, is taken up with the work in, in linguistic landscapes. And there's a debate uh, in that field about whether we should talk about linguistic landscape or semiotic landscape. Um, Alana Shohami has stuck with the idea of linguistic landscapes. She's the editor of the journal called Linguistic Landscape. Um, but interestingly, uh, Alana, uh, in the first uh, uh, volume of, the, of that uh, journal, talks about this expansion of the linguistic into a much broader view of semiotics. And it's interesting when we look back at the linguistic landscape work, and a lot of that originally took the idea of a sign. A sign was actually a, a really signage, right? They were particular uh, signage in public spaces, so street signs and so on. And then people looking at often the representation of different languages in that landscape. Um, landscape fairly undefined, but as a public space. And there so signs referred particularly to, to public signs. Um, that's expanded and shifted quite a lot what both what signs and landscapes mean over the last few years. Um, and here, Alana talks about this idea of um, linguistic landscape. And for her, that remains linguistic, interesting enough, right? That includes images, photos, sounds, movements, music, smells, graffiti, clothes, food, buildings, history, uh, as well as people immersed and absorbed in spaces. So it's a very broad view of what is included in, into that uh, domain. Uh, and uh, just the, the image I have on the top right hand corner here uh, of a bicycle, I mean, that's, that was actually from a paper uh, that uh, I wrote that came out in Linguistic Landscape last year about uh, what I was calling bikescapes uh, and uh, looking at how these uh, share bikes uh, change the semiotics of the city. Uh, so from this point of view, we can be looking at um, some notion possibly still of linguistic landscape where we're not looking at anything that might be traditionally called language uh, in that domain. Let me just jump to a slightly larger picture here of how I'm thinking about some of this. Uh, this, this idea of the uh, colonial, uh, the modern colonial linguistic settlement, um, this I draw on from uh, Bruno Latour's work. And Latour talked quite a long time ago now about what he called the modernist settlement. Uh, for Latour, the question was this. He said, "Why? how is it that we at a certain point in the development of modernity, settled on a range of agreements that, in a sense, my the human life was in here. Language he doesn't talk so much about language, uh, but thought and so on is is in inside in the head. The world is out there, um, and he then has I think God up there and society down there or something like that. I've reframed this a bit, and I've added the colonial because I think 
when you look at the argument from Mignolo, uh, de Souza Santos and various others, uh, they're arguing that we can't really look at modernity without also understanding coloniality as part of that. Um, so I'm interested in what I've then called this modern colonial linguistic settlement, um, which asks this question of how is it that we, at a certain point, came to decide um, and what are the implications of doing so that language is something that goes on really inside this part of the head and it's linked to uh, the eyes and the ears. Uh, it's something we read, it's something we hear, um, possibly also speak, of course, uh, and that part of the, the challenge of Western philosophy has engaged with this for a long time is how do we understand the relation between what goes on in the head and the world out there. So we need uh, ideas of representation, how the world is represented in the mind and so on. Um, of course, that division also leads to relations of exploitation. That's partly how we've come to deal with the world in such a, a, a negative way in some ways uh, because of our this division we make, that we're, we're separate from the world. The world, you know, we've got things going on in our head that's not part of, not the same thing as the world out there. And then we've got society over there where we need uh, frameworks of contextualization in order to understand uh, that our language is then used in that space rather than starting from that as the beginning point. Um, and then we've got these other domains of exclusion. Um, so in this notion that the language goes on in the head, we exclude the body, um, we exclude a range of others, um, and th this has been uh, very much around, uh, has been gendered, it's been raced, uh, and also, it's been very uh, much a species definite uh, position that excludes animals and so on. So the, the notion of language that was developed uh, in this settlement, as we can call it, uh, is a very particular vision of language. And it's, uh, my, one of my questions is, how and why did we get there? And how might we want to think about that differently? So when we think uh, about, uh, and this links to some of the work I've done around post-human, post-humanism, uh, and it's interesting, um, Tony Stebbins makes this point about when you look at introductory uh, linguistics textbooks, uh, and they focus very much on what counts as language. They say, okay, these are the things that are part of language, signs, rules, and so on. And these are things that are not part of language. Uh, animal language is not. Uh, things, objects are not. Smells, those sort of things are not part of language. Um, and you can see in relation to what I was talking about before, about that this large inclusion we're now seeing, that this is now becoming a rather fragile set of definitions. Um, what became very clear to me uh, when I was trying to work through post-humanism and so on was that the notion of language that we got from the humanist account is, is, was based very much on the insistence that language uh, is something that hu distinguishes humans from the animals. This is a very important part of humanist thought, and, it, and it's something constantly repeated, that, that language is what distinguishes humans from animals. Uh, and I said that one of the things that happens with post-humanism, you start to question those divisions. And I think one of the interesting things is I realized that the work that had been done on language, the way we define language, is very much based on the attempt to make that distinction. If you want to constantly argue that it's language that distinguishes uh, humans from other animals, um, you have to define language in a very particular, rather narrow way that doesn't include a lot of things that animals or other animals, we always forget that humans are, of course, animals, um, that they also do. Uh, and so the, the image of the way we think about language has been, uh, as I say here, rather arcane and disembodied because of that attempt to, uh, to construct language in particular ways. So typically, uh, here's you know, maybe this rather stereotypical, the Saussurian uh, heads uh, with language just passing back and forth, coming out of the mouth, passing to the other person through the ear, into the head, decoded, pass back and forth. And again, we see, we don't see bodies, we don't see any complexity, just two heads passing linguistic signs back and forth. That is, of course, then central, has been to uh, certain versions of language. And I, I'm aware I'm talking about very particular versions of language here. We have sentences uh, like this has become kind of fairly central, at least to one tradition of linguistics. So all these things are kind of in, they're part of, of what's in language. 
if we take uh, bodies, dance, movement, sexuality, and so on, they're not part of the general, more general linguistic, or haven't been part of the more general linguistic interest. Um, if we think about animals, graffiti, smells, and this is one of the few pictures I managed to get that does all three of those together, um, they're, they're all things that are not really part of what we would have as, as the what's in language. So I want to move now to, to this larger framework I've been talking about of speaking to semiosis. Um, the speaking goes back to Himes. Uh, I'm very aware, of course, uh, that uh, using Himes now has become a, a question of whether we should be, whether, uh, as some people have said, Himes should be cancelled um, uh, because of that long history of sexual misconduct and, uh, and also the, the cover-ups that uh, went on around that for a long time at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I think we actually do need to deal with Himes. Uh, I don't think we should, we can just um, brush him out of our history of social linguistics, but I think we always need to have that, that discussion. Um, I think, as a number of people have pointed out, we also need to have a different discussion, which is also about why are we still talking about Himes and why aren't we, um, what is it about the history of social linguistics? That means we're not talking about uh, women of color from the global south as uh, co participants sufficiently in. Uh, social linguistics. So there's a range of discussions we need to be having about this. I'm going to still use Himes a bit, um, though with caveats and, and concerns. Um, this I'm assuming people are fairly familiar with is, is Himes' uh, speaking framework. That is, we have the acronym speaking and the, it refers to the uh, situation participants. The, the first letters of speaking got run down the left-hand side of this, so situation participants ends acts key and so on. And they, these refer then to setting and scene, people, goals, um, act, sequence, and so on. Um, and of course, Himes was a fairly uh, broad uh, social linguist. He, he um, really at, at the beginning of some of that social linguistic work and a very exciting time uh, where a lot of debates around what would be in and what would be out. And of course, Himes did have quite a broad view uh, also with the ethnographic sensibility of his and was interested. In fact, in some other things like smells, if you look at some of his work, he had an interest in some of those things. So this is the model um, he started to use and, uh, and became very influential in things like the ethnography of communication and so on. And I, I would think a lot of people would be fairly familiar with this. I've um, been playing around with this and in through the work I've been doing, uh, with our own ethnographies of communication in, in various settings. Um, I'm kind of proposing a, a slightly different framework. I don't want to put this up as a model. I don't particularly like models. I just, and it, it also changes. I've done a few different versions over the, of this over the last year or so. I, it's always difficult to get the, the letters and the ideas to work well. So I'm happy to have it as a fairly flexible framework for people to, just to, give people something to reflect about uh, when we're thinking about what is involved. Um, and again, it's, I didn't start um, trying to think about the total speech situation. Um, as I said, it's always a problematic idea. Neither did I try to come up with this idea. This sort of evolved out of thinking as we're working and thinking, oh, we need to think about this, we need to think about that, what about that? Um, and so as I put this together, I started to play with this. So again, this works a bit like uh, when the same way that Himes's model um, where we have the phrase semiosis. Um, so I'm drawing on this broader view of, of semiotic landscape, semiosis, and so on. Um, and the first letters of semiosis run down the left-hand side here. So um, S for social relations. So we're going to look at social background. E for emotional or affective and uh, sensorial domains. The M for mobility. Um, I for uh, iterative activity and social practices. O for objects. Uh, and the idea of assemblages, I'll come back to all these ideas. Um, S for social and translingual practices, uh, I for interactivity, and S for spatial repertoires. And I'll be explaining all of those in a moment. So um, what I'm going to do is draw on some of the work uh, from our um, quite long-term now uh, Metrolingual project that uh, Emi Otsuji and I have been engaged in for uh, actually about 10 years now, um, to our surprise. Um, we, we've we used this term metrolingualism. Um, some people like it, some people don't. Uh, it was our attempt to try and grasp ways of thinking about language and the city um, 
trying to escape some of the frameworks that were seem to be built into ideas of multilingual cities and so on. We wanted to draw a different kind of relationship between language and the city and space and so on. Um, I'm not necessarily wedded to the term metrolingual, but it sort of worked quite well for us. Um, we, in a recent paper, um, we talked about this idea of mundane metrolingualism, where we were trying to get at the point, it was really a challenge that's been raised, of course, a number of times about the ways in which those of us looking at uh, diversity in urban or rural or other contexts, uh, possibly um, we, we look at this uh, diversity as a sort of exceptional. We're trying to say, no, we're trying to argue against that. So no, we've always worked on this as, as the argument that just as there's a common argument that multilingualism is the global norm, um, the kind of diversity we're looking at is very ordinary. Um, and I've always drawn here on the work of, of Michael Higgins, the late Michael Higgins, uh, and in his book on um, drawn on a, uh, his ethnographic work in Oaxaca in, uh, in Mexico. Um, and Michael Higgins, and in his book in Higg with Higgins and Cohen, um, talks about diversity is the given uh, reality of human social action. Uh, and he talks about uh, the people he worked with, the drag queens, uh, the discapacitados, the disabled, um, and says, you know, they, they saw themselves as, as very ordinary and they wanted people to know that they were ordinary. Of course, I think there's, a, there's some, still something of a contradiction here that when we're looking at the ordinariness of, of people's lives, of, their, of the diversity of their, of their multilingualism, whatever, um, we're still making something of it in a way that uh, makes it not ordinary in our um, uh, production of that in, into academic text. So there's always a slight give and take with this idea. But again, I want to come back to, to this idea of ordinariness. And we've also talked about that as being every day and other terms that people are using are grassroots from below and so on. Um, and actually, de Souza Santos talks about bottom-up subaltern cosmopolitanism, using this, the bottom-up idea. Um, and the subaltern, right? To say that this is about everyday uh, diversity um, and also intercultural translation, as, as he says. Um, so our current focus within this project is what we've called everyday and simultaneous. Um, the simultaneous is, it comes out, and I'll, I'll come back to that, of, of particularly because of the use of mobile phones and so that we get these interactions now where people are talking, uh, they look as if they're talking to each other, but they're actually talking to other people through other media at the same time. And we've now developed uh, in, in a lot of places this sort of simultaneous spatiotemporal entanglements. Um, entanglements has been the term we've used along with assemblages as quite important ways of thinking about all these things, how all these things connect together. Uh, and we've talked then about concurrent spatial repertoires. I'll talk a bit more about spatial repertoires a bit later, um, but how they, they, they're concurrent in that, you know, we've got different sets of uh, social linguistic uh, interactions going on across different space and time because particularly of, of mobile technologies. And so we're interested in the idea of assemblages uh, and how all these things come together. And we're looking at these at one particular store now in, in Tokyo. Um, corner stores in general, uh, we found very interesting uh, places and we did, we uh, edited with uh, Zhu Hua, uh, a, a volume of uh, social semiotics a few years ago or 2017 uh, with a number of colleagues looking at uh, particular markets and, and corner stores. Um, they're very interesting places because of the kind of social interactions that go on there. And we're trying to look at this multilingually, multimodally, and multisensorially. Um, and looking at, uh, I mean, one of the interesting things about uh, these stores is that uh, small, if you're um, of migrant background, uh, small stores are one way of, of running a small business, restaurants and things are another. Um, but you then um, usually, pitch it at, at a particular set of people, but that also then produces a range of other uh, interactions of people of different backgrounds coming and buying things there and so on. And we'll look at that in a moment. So one we've look, looked at is this um, Bangladeshi one, run one in, in, um, in Tokyo. Uh, quite why we're looking at this is, you know, some of these are accidents of how we fall into various research projects. Uh, we also looked at uh, some Bangladeshi run stores in uh, in Sydney uh, and did some kind of not formal comparisons, but we were interested in the, the differences. Um, and we were actually hoping at this time 
uh, or in June to have been in Bangladesh uh, following up some of these, but um, like everyone else, we're not doing any traveling this year. Um, so we're not able to do any of that or follow up on some other research we wanted to do at this store. But we've worked there for a while. Um, they seem to be happy for us to turn up and work there. And um, they somehow think we might be good for business. I'm not quite sure they're right, but we, we have a kind of good relationship with these people there. Um, and so they're looking at these multilingual stores. Uh, and as you can see, they, they kind of frame themselves not um, Overt, I mean, they're not trying to set themselves as up as multilingual in a way, but they certainly use, as you can see at the top sign here, their older sign. They've got Arabic, uh, Japanese. Um, uh, let me just see there. Um, Nepali, uh, Bangla, and so on. Uh, the different scripts, different languages. Uh, they've got a simple version on a newer sign below where they kind of drop some of that complexity. Um, but, but we see this sort of frame multilingually, not because they're trying to do it that way. They're just trying to capture different audiences and announce what they do. Um, but again, it's this idea of these corner shops, as, as Martha Kalavec says in her study of uh, a Thai run store in Copenhagen, uh, this contemporary corner shop cosmopolitanism um, and how this everyday diversity unfolds in these contexts. So this is the context of our work. Um, I, I thought about showing the video of this, but it, it, it's a bit long, it's a bit slow. Um, it's, it's always interesting that, um, you know, the difference between what we write down, end up writing down in scripts uh, or transcripts and the kind of slowness of, of the video. Um, it, of course, provides a lot of extra information that we're not going to get, but I, I thought it's, it's difficult in this medium and it takes up rather a lot of time to do that. So I'm just going to run through the transcript. Um, this is a, a, a moment of interaction where we see the, the shop assistant here. Uh, this is one we call shop assistant one uh, on the right and the customer uh, on the left. And the customer is buying, um, buying a number of things that the, a lot of this interaction is around. He's trying to buy a particular kind of fish. And as we'll see, and I'll talk about that again later, uh, fish are very important uh, in a lot of these interactions, uh, particularly in Bangladeshi stores because of uh, particular uh, culinary uh, practices uh, within a range of different communities. So the, uh, the customer on the left here um, is speaking to the uh, assistant, says, I know, uh, not this one. Um, he uses English here. Uh, English is one of the languages used in the store, not really the default. Probably the most common language would be Bangla, uh, particularly amongst the staff. Then it depends on who the customers are. Um, Generally, they'll use uh, English as one option, uh, Japanese, of course, another. Uh, also, Hindi, Urdu, uh, Nepali, which are related anyway, um, and a few other options. Um, the customer here chooses English uh, as his option. He says, I know, not this one. She said, not this one. Um, and he's talking, he's just had a phone conversation uh, with someone uh, who's trying to help him buy the right kind of fish. Uh, at this point, um, the uh, shop assistant, SA1, um, he's, also, he's making a phone call on his mobile phone. This is sort of going on to the side here. And this is, again, one of these things we've been interested in, that you have these two people face-to-face -face across the counter. Uh, the counter is a very interesting space, too, and we're kind of interested in how we get multiple interactions happening along this counter. Um, but they're talking to each other across the counter here. But um, we also see them kind of uh, having different conversations with other people at the same time. Um, at this point, um, shop assistant one talks to the second shop assistant, who's just in the background there, uh, and asks him to go and try some other fish. Um, he says, in, in Bangla, smoked fish. So go, go on, can you go and get the other big, uh, the bigger smoked fish, uh, bring the big one, and so on. So he speaks to him in Bangla, and, and the other guy goes off to, to look at the other fish. Um, the, Customer then is uh, still he's still got his phone going. He says hello, okay. Um, and these are things we you know, we kind of interested in. What if you want to categorize in languages? What we do with things like okay that sit across all sorts of languages. Meanwhile, um, we then get the third shop assistant on the phone. Uh, he says hello, um, and then uh, shop assistant one speaks to him again in in Bangla. Um, um, tell him to get a case of some American product. Uh, uh, so he's speaking then on the phone in Bangla to a third person who's not present in the shop here. And the, uh, then the um, 
third shop says, ah, cha, okay, you know, he's going to get the, the, the other case of American goods. Um, and that fun conversation finishes there. Um, then they got the other fish back and said, oh, maybe this one better, not small fish. Uh, the customer then gets back on his phone and says, ah, alors, il faut regarder ton portable, on dirait ça, ce qu'il vient de me montrer là, etc. Uh, so he's speaking French to his uh, the person on the other end of the phone. Um, Je vais t'envoyer, don't worry. Uh, da, 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 he's just sort of waiting here, da, 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 da. he's sort of waiting a uh, while. Uh, so he's taking a photo of the fish uh, so that the other person can judge whether this is the right fish that they want. Um, he goes on in French a little later. There's a bit of a gap here. Um, so, you know, you've got to have a look uh, and so on. Um, and then finally in, in eight here, he says, Allo, c'est pas ça, okay. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not the right fish. Um, so he then turns back to the, the shop assistants, ah, no, <coughs> not this one. Kind of like, <coughs> I say, yeah, sorry, uh, not this one. Um, and then shop assistants, who's been kind of waiting rather patiently here, kind of gets a bag and um, says one or two things. And then um, the customer says again, oh, no, not this one. Uh, and then back to the person he's talking to on the phone, oh, she says, oh, hello, there's a little bye. Um, and then finally they pack up, he's buying some other goods, some um, goat meat, and goat meat's a whole other interesting issue here. Um, and he packs up some other goods and uh, that's the end of this interaction. So I'm gonna deal with this plus a few other ones to talk through this, this idea of semiosis. So the first part of that frame, as I said, is the S of uh, semiosis, social relations. And of course, this is the point we need to account for people's backgrounds, uh, gender, class, race, religion, and so on. Um, and I'm interested in this also looking at this very much in relational terms. Um, that is, they're not um, being of, um, for this customer who's French West African background, uh, this, what that means, of, uh, that's got a, a certain personal trajectory, but it also means something very different in terms of who you're talking to. Here he's talking to a, uh, a person of Bangladesh background in a store in Tokyo. It's different from when he's talking to, say, Japanese outside that and so on. Um, so we're interested in part in that, uh, the relational parts of, of social identity. Um, the store itself uh, is, um, is Bangladeshi owned and run, um, and it's located in a uh, place called uh, Isorama Yokcho, uh, Islamic Alley, in, in Shinjuku, in fairly central Tokyo. Um, lots of different people come here, and I'll come back to that again in a moment. Um, so people come um, partly for halal food, uh, partly for the fish, for other um, products uh, and we've also got sim cards phones and, and a range of things uh, a range of reasons why people come there and that brings different language culture and so on to it um, so it matters that of course that this this customer um, the one actually in the image here is actually of someone of Bangladeshi background uh, the one we we're just looking at is West African French West African um, background um, what he's buying how he speaks and so on are all then part of that interaction um, just to give a different example um, of, of these social relations, this was a, uh, around the same time, uh, there were three young men of uh, Uzbek background um, who uh, kind of wander into the shop. They're not really sure where they are. Um, they've just sort of found this shop and they, um, uh, they I mean, this alley, the, the Islamic alley is sort of a place where, you know, you can find a variety of different goods. Uh, and they speak uh, to each other in, in Uzbek, uh, um, one of them says, uh, so who are these darker people that seem like Indians? Um, this, uh, you know, it's interesting because the, the shop doesn't announce itself as a Bangladeshi store. It's, it's, it's not. They call themselves a, a spice sort of store. They've got a variety of Asian, uh, African foods and so on. Um, and these guys are saying, you know, who are these people? <laughs> like, um, uh, you know, this, this asking who are these darker people, uh, we can see that as a slightly racist uh, construction of them that they, you know, they're just saying, are they Indian? Are they Bangladeshi? They don't, they're not too sure. Right? Of course, it doesn't really matter. Um, then there's an interesting moment. Uh, one of the shop assistants uh, sees them kind of standing around the counter and says, oh, can I help you, brother? Uh, in English. Uh, and we've talked a lot to the shop assistants about how they make those decisions about what to use. Um, the um, these guys don't speak much English, uh, but they, one of them at least speaks a reasonable amount of Japanese. Um, and he sees on the counter here 
Um, the, on the counter, sort of covered with a bit of clear plastic, there are a number of banknotes uh, that they, they've collected. Uh, and he, f he sees there a 500 sum uh, note from, from Uzbekistan, uh, and he points to it and, and says to the shopkeeper, uh, This is in Japanese, right? This is, this is ours. Uh, and the shopkeeper or the shop assistant says back, ah, Uzbekistan, the show. So you're, you're from Uzbekistan. Um, and so they have this sort of moment of, of identification here where they're able to say, oh, this is who we are. Um, they've got, in this context, rather limited um, linguistic resources to do that. Um, the, and it's interesting, too, that the, the, the presence of these uh, workers from Uzbekistan is also part of changing visa regulations from 2019 in Japan, uh, where they're uh, now trying to attract uh, a range of different workers and in different industries, and they've been changing the visa regulations and the residence regulations. And so we're seeing more workers uh, from places like Uzbekistan now working in cities like Tokyo and then coming to stores like this, which has kind of interesting uh, linguistic and cultural implications. But yes, yeah, so we're interested in this particular moment of identification with the importance of these. Uh, the banknotes here, which help these guys say, this is, this is who we are, we're from Uzbekistan. The second, the, the E of um, semiosis is the emotional and sensorial engagement, affective relations. Um, and again, this goes back to the question um, raised earlier with the, the modernist settlement um, of the, uh, the way language got located in the head. We've seen, uh, we see through the social sciences and humanities a range of uh, what are often called turns. Uh, we've seen the affective turn, the sensorial turn. We should be skeptical about these turns a bit, but they're also quite useful for raising a range of issues that we haven't been looking at. And it, there's been quite a push to say we need to, uh, in social linguistics and related domains, uh, bring in much more of the affective, the emotional, and, and also of the senses. Um, because one of the interesting things about that location of, the, of language uh, linked very much to questions of, of the literate mind. Um, and, and this came out of really uh, a particular class, particular group of people uh, who were able to think of language in those ways as something to do with, uh, with reading and writing. It's very much to do with the head of, of things going in through the, the eyes and so on. Um, the other senses were left out of that pretty much. So smell, uh, touch, taste, and things were not part of that notion of, of the, these are the lower senses, they're actually called that, right? And we've been interested in saying, yeah, where do those sit? Um, and I'm interested in, in uh, Crispin Thurlow's uh, critique of, of areas such as discourse studies. We talk, uh, talks about his interest in anthropological writings that engage with the material world of stuff, objects, and things, and also with the immaterial world of affect, emotions, and feelings. And so we need to bring this in. Um, and as he says, our, our sorties into other semiotic worlds are very textual. And it's be important to think about embodied, intuitive, affective ways of doing and knowing. So we've been interested in bringing this in. We've, um, some of the work we've done uh, has actually looked to sing its smell and, and the idea of smellscapes. It turned out uh, we kind of thought we'd discovered smellscapes when we were thinking about various stores we were working in and then realized there was a huge literature, in fact, on smellscapes and smells. And this idea of uh, smell walking, uh, which comes from Pink and her work, uh, and these people doing these urban ethnographies where they actually walk around uh, looking at smells, or not looking, um, smelling smells, and, and thinking about the urban environment in very different ways. Um, so for us in, in the particular store we're looking at here, um, not the one in the image so much, that was a part of a different smell walk we were doing in, actually in Sydney. Um, the, but when we think about this Bangladeshi store, it has a lot of smells, uh, sounds, uh, they're very particular to the spices they sell, the goods they sell, uh, the, the dried fish um, always has a certain aroma around those stores. Um, but also then these emotional things, the hopes and desires of shopping. This customer is trying to buy the right fish. He's really hoping he's going to get it. He's got someone else on the line who's checking whether he's got the right fish. And there's a certain frustration. And again, that's why it would be nice to show that video, though it's, um, it shows, um, you know, they, this interaction goes on a while. And uh, the, 
the shop assistant is kind of getting a little impatient. I mean, he's, he's a very cool, patient guy, but he's, you know, he's, um, he's standing there kind of thinking, okay, come on, get on with it, you know, and, and, and the, the customer's a bit apologetic uh, when he says, oh, okay, yeah, sorry, it's not the right one. Um, so there's a lot of uh, affective work going on, uh, linked to the body and so on in this engagement. The M takes us to questions of mobility. Um, uh, and as, as Jan Blomet has pointed out, he says mobility is the great challenge um, in that uh, he certainly argues that we've uh, tended in social linguistics to, to work with a fairly static set of ideas of how language relates to place. And he's argued, Blomet's argued that we need to think much more about mobility. Of course, this has raised a, a lot of questions too about whether this is a, uh, only a contemporary set of issues or whether this is a long-term set of concerns that is all, mobility has always been there. And, and just because we're seeing maybe more mobility because of forms of migration in parts of uh, the global north, um, we would be very mistaken to think that mobility is something new. Um, we do need to think a lot about mobility, however. And, and as I said, this store attracts people um, from South Asian backgrounds, looking for kind of familiar foods, um, things like goat meat, uh, the fish and so on. Um, of course, people of Muslim background, it advertised itself as having halal food. Um, we see people of Maghrebi background in search of, uh, we'll see that in a moment, of uh, particular foods, lentils, chickpeas, and so on. Um, West Africans uh, who have various connections in terms of their cooking, uh, interest in goat meat and so on. And of course also Japanese uh, come, um, they're interested in cooking curries and things often come with a list and work out how, what products they need. Um, and we were interested, the image here on the left is a suitcase. Um, this is brought by a customer. I think this was a customer of a Pakistani background, married to a Thai woman. Uh, they live on a, in a different part of Tokyo. And so he comes, um, once a month maybe with a big suitcase and packs up the suitcase with with all these goods so we get this um the, the store itself attracts this different mobility of people so within tokyo uh, and then of all these different backgrounds because of the products itself um here's an example um this is a, a woman uh from morocco um and she's walking around you can see in her hand here the, the shopping list uh and she's um and it's, it's interesting, the shopping list itself sells, sells things like viande uh, and barcook, um, boulette, and the small meatballs. Uh, she's got viande and kafta crossed out, then changed out the kafta tomate. She's changed the recipe a bit. Uh, couscous, uh, and then these Moroccan dishes, uh, zalouk, uh, taktuka. Um, and, and so, yes, yeah, she's, uh, she's shopping. She uses kind of this mixture of French and um, Moroccan, uh, Moroccan Arabic words for the dishes. And of course, this. Uh, that's all part of that whole relationship do between North Africa and France. This could be uh, in France, it could be France in North Africa, uh, but here it's this, um, this movement uh, that's happened now into uh, this store because the store is good for buying things like chickpeas and you can see the basket here, they've stocked up with a lot of dried chickpeas. They like the particular chickpeas that uh, are sold here and they've got a range of different varieties and so on. So these, these people have um, Maghreb, uh, North African background, uh, come to buy particular goods that uh, they find in the, in the Bangladeshi store. Um, the I is for iterative activity, and here I'm getting at the, the idea of social practice. Um, this is to think about uh, repeated social activity uh, and links again to that idea I mentioned at the beginning of, of Butler talking about the need to, to think about the effect of speech acts being partly dependent on its repetition over time. Uh, this is to take us to another of these social scientists, scientific turns, that is the practice turn. Um, and the idea that uh, social life is organized uh, in terms of practices. And indeed, Shatsky talks about practice as the new discourse. Um, he says, you know, we used to talk about discourses in the Foucauldian sense, uh, we can now talk about practices. Um, whether we want to replace, so it seems that discourse and practice can work quite well together. Um, but uh, people are interested in this idea then of, of uh, how we have these um, groupings of, of repeated activities. So we have things we might call banking practices, cooking practices, religious practice things, things we do together, shopping practices become particularly important in this context. And we can also think of language, um, language as a social practice and also think about 
um, the way that what we see as regularities in language, which we often assume are the result of some underlying system, are in fact the product of uh, repeated social action. They are social practices. Um, Bourdieu, of course, was a strong theorist of, of practice. Um, and, and as Bourdieu points out, your practices are also actions with a history, right? They, uh, this is what gives them part of their effect. Um, and so we need to account for time and space, history and location when we're thinking about practices. Um, when we think about this store, um, of course, we've got um, shopping practices are important here. Um, this little interaction is from a similar time, but a different interaction from the one I was showing at the beginning. And again, this is a, a customer from Bangladesh. Uh, this one interested us just because we've got, uh, in a sense, two sets of social practices uh, cutting across each other. The customer's trying to work out, he's trying to buy some chicken uh, and talking to the, uh, the shop assistant. The shop assistant is actually much more interested in the cricket game that's going on. Um, it's actually Bangladesh playing New Zealand in a tournament in England. Um, and he's setting up a mobile phone by the till there so he can uh, live stream the game. And a lot of what goes on in this interaction is he's in this, his social practice of, uh, of, of watching cricket. Uh, and he's then commentating on it. He's, uh, he's kind of cursing Mushrafa, Mushrafa, the Bangladeshi cricketer, and saying, you know, he's wasted runs, uh, you know, he's stupid. He's, you know, he uses quite a lot of vulgar expressions, actually kind of critiquing the, the Bangladeshi team um, in their game against New Zealand uh, in England. He's also annoyed about the English weather, or it's actually in Wales, I think. Um, uh, and, and meanwhile, the, the, the customer trying to keep on his shopping practices and getting these half answers about the price of chicken and so on. So we get sort of two sets of social practices kind of cutting across each other uh, in a way that sort of interests us here. Um, the O uh, takes us back to the, the importance of objects. And this, as we've seen, is, is part of the work uh, that uh, has been raised through post-humanist thinking. Uh, it's there in, in the work of Latour, of course, in actor network theory, and also the new materialism. And it's just saying we need to, to consider in, in ways that have been, uh, haven't been so much in, in other ways of separating humans from the world around them. Uh, the importance of, of objects and so on. And the idea of assemblages has become very important in this. Um, and we've talked about the idea of, of semiotic assemblages as the, as the way that uh, people, language, uh, objects, place come together. Um, the idea of assemblage uh, goes back to Deleuze and Guattari in particular, uh, agencement, as they say in French. Um, uh, and Jane Bennett, uh, in her, her book on what she calls vibrant matter, um, talks about assemblages as ad hoc groupings of different elements of vibrant materials. She actually looks at, at things like uh, power failures and says, how do we understand the totality of a power failure uh, as something that happens? And, and where do we want to put agency? A lot of discussion in this context of um, agents or actants, as Latour calls them, of how do we understand the, the role of objects in relation to human action? Um, of course, that um, that sort of discussion shifts what we mean by uh, an actant or of agency. It's not to say that uh, certain objects have intentions, as we might want to ascribe to humans, but they play a particular role uh, that can influence what humans do. Um, so we're interested in this idea and the role of a range of objects, the, the food products, uh, phone cards. We have a lot of interactions around phones and, and so on because uh, uh, because of the, the customers and, and a range of, of reasons why. So, so to us, this idea of assemblages gives us a good sense of, of the ways in which a lot of these things come together in particular moments. Um, the fish have been particularly important for us. Um, we, we realized, um, and particularly actually looking at some of the Bangladeshi stores in, in a suburb in Sydney, we found that uh, the there were a lot, of, a lot of interaction. They have a lot of often freezers in the middle of the store where there are frozen fish. Uh, and there's a lot of interaction around these freezers, uh, talking about the fish, the frozen fish, were they clean, were they boned, what kind of fish were they? Um, and, and a common fish was actually this one called a tilapia. Um, we were very interested in having realized how important fish were. And this is when we're trying to think, what, where do we put fish into our social linguistics of, of this shop? Um, but this was... Um, paper by, by Sen uh, in 
in Chicago uh, looking at Bangladeshi stores, we came across this, fortunately, and found that, yes, for him also, he said, you know, fish are extremely important. Uh, and he, he talks about these common food cultures and then how uh, the importance of fish brings different people together. Um, he's looking mainly at, at Bangladeshi and South Asian uh, connections. We've been interested then that we've found a lot of people, say, from West Africa, also have this interest in similar dried or frozen fish. Uh, and the images here, in fact, um, the one on the top, the, the, the tilapia, this sort of I love, I, I love tilapia. Um, it's a picture of a tilapia. That's, that's the, <clears throat> you can see it in the image above, uh, the small picture there. The, um, this is actually in, in uh, Belleville in, in Paris, a very multicultural suburb. This is a Chinese run. Um, you can see the Chinese just on the left there. Uh, supermarché or superstore, um, and they also sell tilapia, and, and that's of course because you've got uh, people from Maghreb, but also uh, particularly West Africa around that suburb, and so this fish again becomes a particular item that's commonly bought with then particular linguistic implications for who shops for what in a, a store such as this, and then what they sell and so on. So these are the assemblages, how these things, uh, and, and, and the role in the sense of these fish in pulling people together uh, for particular purchases and linguistic, with particular linguistic implications. Um, the S refers to social and translingual practice, what we might see as the, uh, the, the standard, the more common parts of uh, our social linguistics. These are the languages there. Um, as we've seen from the sign, they advertise a range of scripts and languages. When we ask the, the shop manager, he, uh, he says, yeah, well, Bangla is the common language we use. We use Urdu, English, Hindi, Nepalese. Uh, one of the other shop assistants says, yeah, Arabi, Mochoto, we all speak, speak of Arabic. And they're really talking about the Islamic greetings uh, in, in that point. Um, of course, he's speaking Japanese at this point, which wasn't in their list originally, uh, and so on. So they've got this range of, of linguistic resources. Um, and of course, the naming of those uh, is important. We talk about uh, languages in those terms. So we're more interested generally in the uh, a more translinguistic framing of this. Uh, and as Liam Dovjin say, the, um, the, these, these ways of talking about those languages are a result of ideological invention and sedimentation. And they don't really guide communication in everyday context. We, we use the linguistic resources. And we're interested in how those come together in this store. Um, as we saw in the example before, we see all these uh, linguistic items, um, the English to begin with, then some, uh, some Bangla, and of course we see the smoked fish used uh, within the Bangla. We could look at that in terms of code switching, translanguaging. In a sense, we're just interested in how all this comes together without wanting to name necessarily what that is. Uh, and then we get a bit of French, hello, uh, okay, whatever that is, Bangla. So these are the, the linguistic resources of of that store. And we're, of course, interested in that as, as social linguists, but uh, as how those fit into the bigger picture of everything that, that's going on in the store. The I um, refers to interactivity, and this is about um, posture, gesture, uh, nonverbal communication. Um, we've known about this for a long time, and I was thinking about um, the late, recently late Charles Goodwin's work. Uh, he's been looking at this in, in complex ways for a um, in, in ways of interaction and nonverbal communication and objects and other things. Um, but I, interesting that, that Bachelors and Hall say that even though we've known this, um, we still tend to see the body in social linguistics as secondary to language rather than as the sine qua non of language. Um, and that is, it's important. I mean, there's, there's various claims about the role of nonverbal communication as being greater than verbal or whatever. Um, I think it's more important to think of this in, in the way that Buckles and Hall frame this as, as um, it is the sine qua non of language. There is no language generally without the body. Uh, we can argue that there are instances of languages, of course, written language without the body, um, but it's very central to obviously a lot of interactions. Um, so we're interested then in the work that nonverbal communication do, the different uh, ways that gestures have iconic, deictic, and so on. Uh, meaning uh, and how this uh, is very much part of the, of the interaction of, of daily interaction. Um, when we look at some of these interactions, um, and again, this would be nice to show on the video, there's a nice moment where, as I said, the, the, the shop assistant on the right here is getting a little tired uh, and he, he actually um, 
uh, gets hold of the handle of the of the basket and kind of moves it back and forth while he's waiting for the customer to finish the phone call and find out if there's the right fish. Um, so we see a lot of this happening bodily. Um, then when it's not the right fish, there's a kind of shrug of resignation, a little laugh, ah, sorry, ah, it's not right, no, not this one. Um, a lot of this is carried on uh, through nonverbal communication and it's very important. Uh, and this can be the use of objects like the handle of the basket, the shoulders, facial expression, and all of that. And it carries a lot of, of the weight of, of social interaction. So finally, the final S of semiosis uh, takes us to this idea of spatial repertoires. Um, the available semiotic resources in a place. Um, the idea of repertoire, of course, has a long history in, in social linguistics, going back to, to Gumpert's, uh, talking about the total of, totality of linguistic forms regularly employed. Um, the, the interesting thing about Gumbitz's work then was he was trying to understand the idea of a speech situation and the, in a sense, the to totality of what people had available for talking. Um, that became, if you look, and we, we've looked a lot at the history of the idea of repertoire, uh, it became a bit of a problem because people couldn't really account for this idea of a speech community uh, and, and how that the speech community has these available resources. Uh, and it, it becomes very clear through social linguistics, they got very much linked to the individual. Um, and then they said the community is too hard. Various people came up with ways of trying to say, we still need to have a different way of accounting for an individual repertoire and a, a more social community repertoire. And Bernstein talks about the idea of, of the reservoir being the community and the repertoire being the individual. Um, but a lot of work, uh, even the kind of more interesting work of looking at diversity uh, in, in kind of the new social linguistics has tended to now look at the individual traje trajectory and their, uh, this sort of social linguistic repertoire that they have. We wanted to take this back to a, what we saw as a more social way of thinking about that. And that as we thought about and looked at markets and shots, we started to think about this as a spatial repertoire um, where spatial is a social category, a drawing on Soya and other spatial theorists, and that would be another turn, probably the spatial turn in the social sciences. Um, but this idea that um, the spatial repertoire gives us a way of accounting for what is available in a particular place and gets us away from the problems with talking about community, and it's really hard to think about community in this context, but also the methodological individualism that's gone on a lot in, in social linguistics in an odd way. Um, Suresh Kanagraj has taken up this idea of spatial repertoires and, um, and he says they're not brought to the activity. And uh, it's pointing to, a, I think, a, a way that Emmy and I initially spoke a bit about that people bringing these repertoires. And I think Suresh is right that it's better to think about this activity being assembled in situ, that it's, it's really uh, the spatial repertoire is what happens in this place produced as this kind of assemblage at that moment. Um, so in the context of the shop, we see spatial repertoire as uh, the totality of linguistic semiotic resources available uh, at any given time, the labels on the food, the, uh, the gesture, the posture, the, all that's going on semiotically uh, is that spatial repertoire at that point. So that's talking through the, the semiosis, I'll call it a framework, I don't want it to be a model. Um, I just want to conclude very briefly um, then Taking this back to a bigger picture, I've been interested in the, uh, the ideas of, of Hart and Negri um, and their work on what they talk about as assembly. Um, and this idea of they're saying, how do we get out of a neoliberal framing of uh, how do we kind of develop a, a work towards a, a, a post neoliberal society? Uh, and they see the idea of assemblage. Um, they're also talking about uh, social assemblies and, and, and so on, but, but out of assemblages. Um, thinking also about not in terms of possessions, but about connections. And that's what has been very central to a lot of this work. Um, I've been working through, uh, again, for various reasons, the work of, of Nancy Fraser and the idea of uh, recognition and redistribution. She says, if we want to understand social justice or justice more generally, um, we need to account for recognition redistribution. But as she's then argued, uh, recognition uh, needs to um, has sort of been taken over and has in a part replaced fundamental questions of redistribution. Uh, that's been taken up by various people saying, yes, we need to uh, really focus on redistribution of, of, 
of, of wealth uh, and the, the maldis or the misdistribution of, of that. Um, uh, but I'm also interested in the possibility of, of rethinking redistribution uh, and re recognition in a different way that thinks about the idea of the distribution of, of language, cognition, identity, interaction as distributed. Uh, and it gives us a way of thinking differently that doesn't only link redistribution to uh, particular forms of materialism. Uh, it takes up a, a new materialism that allows us to think about redistribution in different ways, which I think can reconstitute some of the ways we think about language and politics. Um, so this work we've been doing on what we call everyday mundane metrolingualism, diversity, and so on, um, multilingual, multimodal, multisensory, spatial entanglement. Um, it gives us a way of thinking about the complexity of all that's going on there, um, but also allows us to see more clearly how language is part of a wider set of social, political, material relations uh, in ways I think that are quite productive for us thinking about a broader politics of of what we're engaged in. Um, my interest is not solely in trying to think about the total speech situation, which I think is an impossibility, but about uh, broader political uh, questions about language and so on. So I'm gonna finish there, uh, and I think we'll be open to various questions. I'd be happy to um, field questions and respond to uh, things for a while at least. So thank you everyone for listening. I hope this was uh, useful, interesting, at least for some of you. Thank you. Many, many thanks, Professor Pennycook. That was really an inspiring talk. And uh, there are people here in the chat from all parts of Brazil greeting and congratulating you. There are some questions. Uh, uh, some people who have just said, uh, said hello, like Clarissa Jordão from Paraná, south of Brazil. Oh, Clarissa, hi. <laughs> yes, Professor Kleber from Brasilia, Carla. Oh, <laughs> it's a lot of old friends. I, I wish I could be in Brazil, you know. I... Yes, yes. Renata Gomes and Lorena Araújo from Rio de Janeiro, Erika Campos from, from Mato Grosso, Clovis and Erika from south of Brazil, and Rosane mm. as well. Juliana ah. and Joana from Goiás, all parts of Brazil. So many good friends in Brazil. I, I miss, I would love to be there. <laughs> yes, we all miss you as well. So there are some comments, Professor mm. Benicook, like uh, Domingos uh, Siqueira just mentioned that Couscous is also Brazilian. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> and, <laughs> and Professor Jordão has appreciated that you have mentioned colonial linguistics on your presentation. Um, there are three uh, groups of questions here, and mm -hmm. I just organized in, in these three big themes, like concept, uh, conceptual questions, questions related to power relation and colonialism, mm -hmm. and questions related to multisensorial experience. So mm -hmm. I will start with conceptual questions, right? Okay. Okay, so Diogo Oliveira, is asking here, um, what are, if any, the epistemological differences between multimodal, transmodal, and semiosis approaches to language study? And he also asks, do mediated multilingual discourse studies as proposed by Norris and Scollon and others play any role in the semiosis framework? Clarissa Jordão is also asking you, how different do you think the perspective of semiotic landscapes is from multimodality? What do you see are the limitations of integrationism? So, Professor Pennycook. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. That's a, uh, yes, okay. Um, let me take up the second part of that first set of questions. I think the the, the the idea of the Scollins work. Um, and I, I actually just removed uh, a slide because I had too many um, referring exactly to the Scollins work, um, the, uh, and the nexus analysis and so on. And I, I think, um, look, the Scollins were um, right onto this, uh, very similar ideas um, before a lot of us. Uh, they were kind of ahead of us and, I, and it's very problematic. I removed that. I just, um, I had too many slides. Um, so the, Yes, I think the Scollins and, and their work on Nexus, I, there are things I disagree with a bit with it, but it, it was uh, ahead of where a lot of us were 
10 more years ago, um, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and they were very, uh, very much on top of this thinking about, uh, about space. Um, the, um, I wish I had that slide now, I could refer to it. Um, so yes, I, I do normally try and tie in that connection. Um, the, the question around um, multi, uh, there was the question, the broader question about difference in multimodal, uh, transmodal, yeah, look, I, I've I've tried some of those thinking about transmodal, multimodal. Um, in a sense, I've often been more interested in taking up the the, the trans ideas, but uh, I I'm not always sure how much uh, purchase we get on trying to make those distinctions. I think there are ways we can say that it's more useful to think about transmodal. I've written about that somewhere. Um, I'm I've kind of gone back to talk about multimodal as long as we bring in the multisensorial. Um, which, and that takes us, I mean, the other question I think from Clarissa about um, the multimodal um, semiotic landscapes and multimodality. Uh, the, yes, I mean, multimodality covers, uh, I mean, in, it, in its kind of origins, it was quite limited. It was sort of kind of started out um, particularly looking like text and image. Uh, of course, it's expanded and there's a lot of good work. I think Norris was mentioned and others. Uh, about mediation and uh, these are all interconnected and I could have drawn on uh, admittedly I think more of that to, to connect to to some of these I mean these have informed our thinking um, the why I, I, whether we want to see the multi-sensorial as as also multimodal uh, we can have that argument uh, I to me I think some of the multi-sensorial has been useful for thinking about particular things like smell we can see those as modalities possibly, but it brings this other sense of, of uh, that we need to think, uh, or this is very productive to think about other senses and how that actually changes uh, in quite profound ways how we understand space and history and memory and, and a range of other things. So it's, uh, there are good reasons for making some of those distinctions, but I could see them also being uh, collapsed in some ways. Um, there was the question about integrationism. Yeah, look, um, that's also a long debate um, we're having with a lot of people around integration. And I, I do think, uh, and again, I think there, was, there have been in different uh, ways I've talked about this, I've brought in some questions of integrationism. Uh, and I, um, I have a sort of slightly mixed relation with integrationism. I think they've, I mean, they clearly in a number of ways have been saying the same things for a long time that these, particularly these divisions, I mean, what they see as segregational linguistics, um, you know, the, the divisions that have been made between humans and the world in particular ways uh, are, are unproductive and we need to see uh, language uh, as only integrated as, as part of larger communicative frameworks. Um, the, um, so yes, integrationism, I think, gives us a lot of purchase onto similar ideas. Uh, it's not always, it tends to be a bit of a, a, a framework that closes in a bit on not necessarily uh, having ways of drawing on things like objects or other senses, or um, there's sort of a, um, a way of, of defining uh, integration that kind of actually uh, draws kind of interesting borders around what it does and doesn't do because of well, because of its, its history, I think. And so, yes, I see a lot of, uh, you know, I, I find a lot of integrational work productive and we have very good discussions around this. Um, so, yes, it, it's certainly part of this picture and it does quite a lot of that work. Uh, I don't tend to frame my work in those terms, but I can see a lot of reasons for doing so. And I think, you know, it's a productive area of research. And I can see also why people from an integrational perspective have at times kind of felt that um, they've been saying this like the Scollins and like others for a long time. And, and and yes, I think people like myself need to be wary of not kind of trying to say, oh, we've got these new ideas when we're obviously drawing on a, a longer history of people who've been trying to put those things on the table and saying, we've got to stop this this division of, of language and communication and language in the world. Um, these are part of the same big picture. And so they, um, there's sort of a frustration that I see from some of those colleagues who kind of say, yes, we've, this is what we've been saying. I, I think there are ways we're saying it in slightly different ways, um, but I, I, I do see this part of a larger collective of, of related questions, yeah. Um, I think I've covered those 
that first set of questions there. Um, are there more? Yes, yes, Professor Pennycook. And uh, Clarissa is sending you a message. She's, she has just said, so don't wish to be here right now. Uh, just keep safe in Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> you have many, many good reasons not to come to Brazil. Many, many people have. <laughs> so Brazil is, yes, things are yes. not going well in Brazil. And we're, we're doing actually quite well in, in Sydney. And we can't leave, actually. We, we're kind of restricted from going anywhere. So... Um, but we're reasonably safe, yes. Yeah. And just to let people know, the next year we are going to have the annual conference of integrationism here in Florianopolis, in Federal University of Santa Catarina. So people can bring their questions and problematize mm. the concept. That is a really polemical but very interesting concept. And uh, yes, I think we're also having the Critical Applied Linguistic Conference in Brasilia in June. Kleber can tell you about that. Yes, so there's, there's a number of we may be there next year. Um, yes. Great. Yes, that's great. So we're going to meet everyone. And there is a second uh, group of questions related to power relation colonialism. And uh, Clarissa is asking a question. Why do you think linguists have been so interested in totality? Would it be some sort of desire to control language practice? <laughs> Is such interest over in recent development of applied linguistics? And Elisa Stumpt also wonders if it is actually possible to study totality without exclusions. And uh, Carlos Renato Lopes also wonders why totality? It seems an attempt to make up for things that have traditionally been excluded. The notion of assemblage, for example, involves articulating some things and leaving others out. And I also add uh, my question here, how can the social semiotic of spaces help us southernize our perspective of what counts as language? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, look, the totality question, I mean, uh, um, so Clarissa's question, I think, was, was centrally about around um, <clears throat> why totality. I mean, I, I, I mean, I've been interested, in and I, and as I've tried to say, and I think in response to that second question, I, I'm kind of interested in this history of talking about the, the total speech situations so, and so on. I, I, I'm not wedded to it, and I don't want to claim I'm trying to do it. I just think there's an interesting set of questions that have been there. Um, I. I'm not trying to do that totality. I'm just saying we, we need to, there are good reasons to move towards a bigger set of things we include in what we see as our, our social linguistics. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, in response to Clarissa's point that um, we have been focused on, on the totality much and that, and that that focus on totality has, has been about control. Um, I, th I would argue more that um, the focus has been on a narrower set of um, ideas of language, which have indeed, I mean, the, we've known this, this relation of uh, linguistics and colonialism. Uh, this has a long history and linguistics comes out of, at least in part from, from the colonial encounter and, and the colonial desire to, to uh, describe or of, as we've said, invent languages. Um, the, but that was always a very narrow uh, set of ideas about what language was. Um, and it was only because of that narrowness that people were able to make those, um, to come up with these linguistic inventions and, and give them the names that they've been given. So I, I don't think the search for totality, I mean, it's always problematic because the totality is relational. So people think they've got the totality because they've included um, syntax, morphology, and phonology, right? So that's a totality. Or someone says, no, I've got pragmatics. That's a totality. Um, they're always kind of different totalities. But I, I don't think we've had much of a search for totality. Um, it's been, at least from my perspective, it's been a narrow one. And it's always been about control, um, the way that linguistics has operated in, in relation to, to definitions of language. Um, the but I wouldn't say that, that a search for totalities have been about a different 
framing of control. I'm not quite sure about that one. Um, the, um, so there's the other question about totality and exclusion. And yes, of course, any search for totality, um, anytime we do this, we're always going to exclude other things, right? So uh, we, the moment I say, okay, we should, we could include, this is why I don't want to have this as a, as a model or anything else. I'm just in the moment I include these things, then someone is always going to be able to say, well, why haven't you looked at that? Uh, and, um, and of course, I'm open to, to, to that. I, we always exclude in those moments. Um, the interesting question becomes for us, you know, what are our grounds for inclusion, exclusion, uh, and so on? Um, but yes, that's always part of all the, the, the moment we do that framing, we're including and excluding. Um, so yes, I, I, I would think that a search totality, uh, which I'm not really trying to do, is, is always going to be both inclusionary and always sort of by definition and also exclusionary. Um, I have a feeling I'm missing part of one of the other questions, but I um, was there something else I didn't address there in those questions about uh, power, inclusion, yes. totality? How can, how can the social semiotic of spaces help us southernize our perspective oh, yeah. of what counts as language? Yes, sorry, that was your question. Yes, um, yeah. Look, the this it takes us in different difficult space, and uh, you know, Simfrey McConey and I have been wrestling with this, and throughout the, a recent book on on southern perspectives, because they it's trying to think from this sort of southern perspective uh, opens up a lot of um, really important ways of thinking. Um, but it's really hard to pin down at times. Now, I, mean, I would certainly want to argue just in, in relation to what I was saying just now that the, um, the kind of modernist uh, settlement produced this very narrow uh, version of language that it's very much worth expanding. Now we can see that if we tie the modernist colonial together, we can see then that the uh, 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 a post-colonial or a southern or a decolonial perspective would be exactly about that kind of expansion. Um, in some ways, that's a bit of an easy argument, and we actually need to pin that down. And, and I think we always need to be open to the other possibility that people might say, well, no, actually, you know, we have a narrow southern version of language that, you know, shouldn't be open in those ways. But for me, I've been very interested in um, when we start to think, uh, for example, about indigenous perspectives on language, um, there's the really interesting work in, uh, by Cohen in Colombia about, about forests, how forests think and so on, and about, and about um, how people speak to animals. Uh, and um, he talks about this interspecies pigeon. Um, and, and I've been thinking uh, in terms of uh, some of the ideas we have around um, language revitalization and, and this difficult space around language reclamation, revitalization. Uh, one of the important things I think, uh, and you can see it, I mean, one of the ideas that's been interesting to me is um, there's a recurrent theme we see across a lot of uh, different uh, indigenous people talking about their languages, which have been described in some frameworks as, how, as being dead, right? Their language, um, the languages of been killed and died and so on. People often talk more about them sleeping. And I've been interested in that and thinking, okay, what, what does this mean to talk about a language sleeping? I mean, from a particular spec perspective, if it's not being used, if no one knows the language, and they're just saying it's sleeping in this linguistic uh, description of the language that may exist, um, it's, it's, you can't just say it's sleeping. But of course, when you start to work with indigenous people and their understanding of language, it at times is utterly different. It's actually, they say, no, the language is connected to the land. Um, we can't think about our language without thinking about the land here. Uh, we're not now using that language and that's a great sadness to us, but it's still here in the land. It's there. And you think, okay, we're, we're just talking about a really different way of thinking about language here. Um, and if I frame it from, a kind of modernist um, northern perspective, I'm missing the point about how someone could think about language in those terms. And therefore, therefore what, what on earth it might mean to talk about language reclamation or waking up a language again. And I think there's a lot of interesting work uh, being done around how languages 
uh, operate uh, in relationship to land, or, um, which is also in water. Um, but um, in, in, in these, uh, and they start to give us these fundamentally different ways. Uh, that, I mean, so this needs to be informed by Southern different alternative ways of thinking, either from the more geographical global south or from the global south as I understand by Santos, including indigenous people. You know, I've also been working in northern Norway. Um, Sami, uh, you know, I mean, it's always difficult at times to think of the Sami as, as, as part of the, the global south, given that their definition is almost by northernness um, in northern Norway and, and Finland and, and Finnmark, Sapmi. Um, the, but yes, I mean, the, the, the ways of thinking, I think we, it's really important that we start to grasp how those work, how people see language uh, in relationship to uh, communication, nonverbal communication, drawing in the sand, uh, land, territory, uh, kin, you know, groups of people and so on. Um, if, we, if, we, if we can work with a more expansive understanding of language, we've got a better way of thinking about what language can mean for those people. And that is clearly going to be part of a Southern perspective. So I, um, I hope that part of what I'm trying to get at here has been in a sense informed by doing that talking and thinking and working with different people. Um, uh, some people may see what I'm talking about as reflecting Southern perspectives. Others would quite, for clear reasons, possibly reject it. But I, I think it's, um, I think it, it obviously needs to be informed by that. And I, I think some of these ideas are, I mean, well, they are, from my perspective, informed by a range of, of different um, conversations, readings, understandings of, of how language operates in the world from different perspectives. And it's trying to step out of that framing that we've had from a particular range of ways of thinking uh, that has been, to me, important and has been kind of part of that long project with people like Maconi and so on for a number of years. So I hope that answers some of what you're asking. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Professor Pennycook. You and Maconi should come next year to Florinopolis to talk about the southernizing language policy and sociolinguistics and applied linguistics. Yes. So the third block of questions, oh, okay. the third group of questions is on multisensorial experience. Uh, Professor Joana Plaza Pinto, she's asking you, why is the somatic domain in emotional and sensorial engagement? Isn't the somatic a transversal domain since we need a body to engage any semiotic process in space and time? Uh, and Kelly Barros makes a comment, body language is part of the system when it comes to black English, for example, and also to sign language. And I would add with another question, what concepts of body and experience could contribute to analyze and understand how soundscapes and smellscapes work? Uh, how can we narrate the multisensorial experience? Which language should we use to talk about that, to write about it? Okay. Can you just run the first one past me again? The first one, yeah, the multisensorial, yes. Yes, uh, isn't the somatic, the somatic domain, a transversal mm. domain since we need a body to engage at any semiotic process in space and time? Why is the okay. somatic domain in emotional and sensorial engagement? Doesn't it make part of any uh, uh, communication practice? I think the question is, mm. should it be considered separately? Should we? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, okay, the... Yeah, I, look, I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite clear. The, the, yes, I mean, I, I suppose my point is we can't... We can't really separate these things out. I mean, so in a sense, of course, by, by framing it the way I've done, I've got the somatic, uh, the affective, and, and I'm, I'm not actually that comfortable about putting those two together that you know that's the part of that is a product of trying to come up with these lists um so yes i i, I put those together in ways that maybe aren't that useful um the 
I mean, yes, yeah, so I don't think we, we can talk about is was it transversal? I mean, the, yeah, the, the, the sensorial and the somatic go very closely together. Um, we, whether we want to, we could usefully separate, uh, I think, um, and have them as different categories. I've put them together for particular reasons, just for that framework, really, and the, that could have been pulled out better, I think. Um, the and the let me go to the the, the body language. I mean, the, um, the question around say say black. I mean, but I think all all language is is embodied, right? I mean, some I mean, black English has particular ways of of doing lang uh, bodily um, communication, but but all language does. I mean, the, it's not the same, and there are some um, users of some languages use different amounts of of, of bodily engagement. Um, but but I, th I think the interesting, really interesting work comes with things like sign language, um, because my, um, one of my interests is in, in, in sign language, uh, and, and I think particularly the work of Annelise Kusters, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, and she's getting at this question around the, the division we have between say gesture and sign language, which of course has been made for very particular important reasons. And the whole, the whole way that in a sense linguistics is engaged with sign language say, no, it's a real language. Uh, this isn't just gesture and so on. Now there's an interesting pushback uh, in a way to say, well, actually uh, we can, um, we now need to learn from sign language, right? It's, it's once we've got over the prejudice uh, against, uh, against sign language, say, no, it is in a sense a real language. We're also reducing it to the notion of a language by calling it a real language. And of course, sign language does a lot more. And it's the, the fact that it works in this uh, physical embodied social space uh, means we have to understand uh, a range of possibilities in different ways. Uh, and, and Kustas is pushing to the way this distinction in gesture and sign and um, Working through how, how, in fact, you know, communication does occur. I mean, she's looked, and she actually has one of the papers in the in the social semiotics, uh, uh, the special uh, volume that we edited. I mean, she's got a fascinating piece of of a um, deaf blind uh, person in Mumbai shopping in a market, and 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 one of the things that interests her is then what is the interaction here with with these people who who don't use formal sign but communicate with this person and, and it's sort of often fairly a custom shopping but she's interested in how we you know the complexity of that communication that's going on um so i think yes uh, sign language we need to learn a lot back from from that and particularly the it's really i think it's really intriguing stuff now that we've got over uh, or well in part got over the prejudice uh, that was very much there in a broader public around sign language. We can learn back from uh, the complexity that sign language is different from, from other forms of language and, and has a kind of extra sense that, that links in ways we need to understand about the body and so on. The, the other question about the, how do we uh, talk about smells or these sensorial landscapes? And I, yeah, this is, this is a big problem. Uh, we, um, when Emmy and I first um, started thinking about smellscapes, um, you know, we were kind of excited. We thought, okay, smellscapes. And then we, then we started to we do these smell walks and, and say, okay, how do we talk about this? And we found we're saying, oh, yeah, it smells like fish. I think, you know, okay, what does is, what is it, it smell like? I mean, one, we made very extremely mundane observations. So, you know, we'd walk down the street and said, oh, this smells like you know, what it is. And, and we realized that one of the problems was, one, we needed more training, more thinking of what we're trying to do, but also we thought we've got a very limited vocabulary. We have, particularly in English, um, and other languages have more diverse vocabularies for talking about smell. Um, in English, there are almost no words for, for smell on its own. Um, we tend to say it smells like bacon, it smells like burnt toast, it smells like this. Um, there are a few things like acrid and so on that, that, that seem to be smells rather than taste, because a lot of the other things we can talk about are taste, it's sweet, it's, and so on. Um, so we had to have a very limited vocabulary for that. Um, and that obviously presents a difficulty. We, we tried in one or two talks passing around things that, that have particular smells to kind of get to say, oh, you're just going to have to smell it, right? We, we can't give you 
uh, as we can't talk about it uh, it's a different way of 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 sensing so it, yeah it look it, it presents us with with really quite big problems but one of the things we realized was the importance of smell that that um we know that you know on, on a basic level smell links to forms of memory um that you know smell is often a way that we recall things uh it's it's quite a powerful uh link to to emotional behavior um and it's often for uh, for humans uh, not not that strong we, we you know i mean we it's interesting when we work with with other animals you know particularly things like dogs you know realize that they they're living in this world of smell they go out the door and they're kind of sniffing 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 you know and thinking oh yes that's you know that's the dog from down the road who kind of passed by this tree you know yesterday and you know that they don't think in those terms but they you know they're, they're in this utterly different world we've we've lost at least a conscious sense of that that we actually do quite a lot of smell work how we talk about it how we build it into our research i think is a, is, is a real challenge um and particularly i mean you know i was trying to draw attention to some of that problem of of working through this mode with with zoom uh, online um with just a transcript all I've got ultimately is it's a few images and some written text, and I'm trying to say we need to look at a vast amount of other things. I'm not able to present them here. Uh, I, if I'd shown the video, I could have got more um, of the interaction of the body of, of gestures and various things. The smells we don't have the technology um, to do that, and so um, we've got very limited ways of doing that. Um, so yes, I, I I think there are really interesting difficulties with some of that, um, and I'm uh, I think it's part of an ongoing discussion of what we um, how we want to think about where those fit into our our broader sense of multisensoriality. Um, it's it's a difficult and really interesting problem. I think we have. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Pennycook. That's really fascinating. There are other questions just coming up. Would you like just the last group of questions on politics? Okay, okay. Yes, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, let's do some more. Okay, the last one, the last group of questions on yeah. politics. And uh, Rosana Rocha Pessoa is asking, is saying, good to see you, Pennycook. <laughs> I'd like you to talk a little bit more on the semiosis perspective. How does it stand politically? And uh, I would also ask uh, if we can have a kind of semiotic policy instead of just a language policy. And uh, <laughs> yes, I think there are other questions just coming up, but I think I'll just keep there on the chat and I'm, I'm I, yes, yes, those are the questions. Let's go to the last group of questions. <laughs> I, um, yes, I'm, I'm. I'm just trying to think what to do with that question about the semiotic policy or the language policy. That's a. Um, I'm not. I'm not really sure we want to have a semiotic policy. Well, maybe we do. I mean, it's just that. Uh, I mean, the, the, we know that one of the problems with with language policy uh, is that it always kind of misses its object, right? I mean, they. Or, or also tries to construct its object. I mean, I, I've written on that. Um, this the, the distinction is, say, language policy and language practices. It's the, in the sense that the practices always escape the policy, um, and and that when we talk about a language policy, um, it's it's trying to operate with particular visions of language that don't um, actually describe what people do with language. So, um, but what it tries to do is, in a sense, like construct. Language policy is, in a way, more about constructing a language ideology about what we want language to be thought of. It doesn't actually regulate what people do. Um, of course, it, it it does in some ways, right? If you say, okay, you, you cannot use this language here. If you're in a classroom and you say, okay, um, this is an English-only classroom, um, you're 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 making serious policies about what can and can't be done. How we might um, develop that into a, a sense of, of a semiotic policy. I, I, look, I, I want to leave that for people to talk about this. It's a tricky one. Um, the, the, the bigger question of, of the politics and, and linking to semiosis, I mean, I, I, I know I sort of left that. I mean, I aimed this more at a broader um, 
social linguistic talk uh, rather than trying to bring in some of those wider political questions. What I'm trying to get at in the last part of that is thinking in terms of assemblages and thinking in terms of, um, I mean, I've been engaged for a while now with these debates about um, recognition, redistribution, where we go uh, in terms of, uh, I'm trying to avoid the step back into just saying, okay, we, I mean, of course I agree with the general arguments for, for, for redistribution of, of economic goods uh, that, you know, we live in very inequitable societies. And um, yes, you know, we all have to work for, for ways in which uh, we, we can get a more equitable distribution. Um, and that is redistribution. Uh, the, one of the difficulties though for us as, as applied linguists, uh, social linguists, whatever, is, is actually what we can do with that. We can, we can do that in certain parts of our um, political activist lives. Um, in, our, in parts of our academic lives, and I'm not necessarily trying to draw a strong distinction between the academic and the, ac and the activist at all, but, but um, I'm interested in sort of what we also produce academically, intellectually. And I think part of that um, becomes ways we can think differently about what things like redistribution mean. I mean, we, that has also been part of what's happened with recognition and why we've now got, I think, the, the critique of the, the fact that the idea of recognition and recognizing, uh, uh, recognizing the, the right to, to for uh, same-sex marriage and things like that, that, that why that's been important, but why uh, the problems in part from, uh, that's come from quite a lot of academic work and this was spilled out into a larger public, I think, um, that the, the focus on recognition has possibly taken over uh, from, I mean, it's, it's in a sense, it's like the post-structuralist argument uh, that we're, um, we, we can focus, we believe that uh, changing the superstructure maybe more important than changing the infrastructure. Um, I don't necessarily buy into those distinctions, but it's the way it's certainly framed from certain uh, ways of looking at, at structure and, and agency. Um, but the, so the, we've had in a sense that argument uh, and, and now the, the push, I mean, Nancy Fraser says, you know, we've, we've let recognition take over from redistribution. We need to refocus, uh, we need to recalibrate. I mean, her argument is we need to recalibrate um, the relation and, and you know have a refocus on redistribution some people uh, are taking up that saying no that's why we have to go back to fundamentally to redistribution i think no actually i think we need of course we need to keep the recognition the, the acknowledgement of of people and their difference and so on as, as very important but we do need to not get over to to believe too strongly that that recognition is is going to um, overcome the, the the problems of, of economic inequality, um, but I think we also don't necessarily want to fall back on only on particular versions. This is why I've been interested in, in say the new materialism to to find ways of thinking about um, materiality that that aren't only tied to um, particular ways of thinking about socioeconomic infrastructure, but thinking about materiality in a broader sense that can then help us to think politically about redistribution in alternative ways. Uh, and that's a, that's a bit of a, um, a thought experiment, a, a kind of trying out to think where this takes us. Uh, it's part of where I'm thinking about a, a particular way of thinking politically in relation to new materialism assemblages and so on. Um, and of course it, it shouldn't override all these other ways. You know, yes, let, let's go and march for, you know, just because the government makes a Black Lives Matter march illegal as they did in Sydney because of the lockdown, uh, we still go and march, right? Say, okay, you, maybe you say it's illegal, I'm marching. Uh, you know, there are ma major issues here about how, uh, you know, what's going on with Black Lives Matter. And we need to follow, I mean, it's interesting following in these terms, what's happened to that, um, that, I mean, for us centrally in Australia, a lot of that was about indigenous people and um, deaths in custody. Uh, in, a, in a kind of odd way, this is now because of the, all the arguments around statues and things, it's kind of, it's sort of moved into this problematic space, I think, which is about, you know, we're now talking about should Captain Cook's statue in the park down the road 
um, be left where it is. And I think, okay, yeah, it's, it's an important discussion about certain forms of, of recognition and so on. But, you know, actually, we've lost the point that let's not have a, another debate about a statue of a white man. Let's get back to the issue of black lives in custody. So all this stuff matters. Uh, and um, how we frame our politics in relationship to this is sort of, a, I think, an ongoing set of questions. I think some of this work presents new ways of thinking politically, which is possibly something we need, um, but we should be very careful not to lose at the same time the ways we've had of engaging politically because uh, we have to engage with those questions and we get taken back to the same questions about economic maldistribution, uh, inequality, racism, and so on. And, and if we lose sight of those, we lose sight of, lose sight of, of fundamental issues uh, of, of social life. So um, I'm trying to think of where this takes us, but I'm trying not to lose sight of also the real things that matter for, for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Many, many, many thanks, Professor Pennycook. And uh, before we finish, I would like to remind everyone to go to Aberlin's site and check the previews and future talks of this series. Um, there are several fascinating discussions from our areas of linguistics and applied linguistics. Thanks, Aberlin, for fostering cross-boundary communication and interaction among, among all of us. And Please, everyone, keep safe, keep protected. And Professor Pennycook, would you like to share some final words? Well, just to um, to thank everyone for listening. I, I still find this very strange. I'm just sitting at home talking to a screen, and um, I see Christina, but um, I hear, and it's, it was so nice to hear the cool greetings. And uh, I probably should have been reading the chat, but I'm I'm kind of limited in my multitasking capacities at times. So. Um, uh, I wish I could talk to people and um, as Clarissa said, you know, maybe I shouldn't wish I was in Brazil right now. Um, but yeah, at the same time, it would be nice to see people. And But thanks everyone for listening. Uh, I hope this has been made some sense, been useful. Uh, it's been interesting for me to try and work through and talk about. I clearly need to do some more work, some more thinking about some of this, but uh, just thank you for this opportunity to Abrelin uh, and to, uh, to Christina for sharing this uh, and for all the, I gathered a lot of questions on the chat and a lot of chat. Um, maybe I'll try and catch up with that um, bit afterwards and be in contact with people and uh, maybe we'll see each other next year and can you know keep these interesting conversations going. I hope so. So uh, thank you to all those that have stayed with this and listened and engaged with this. Uh, thank you.